Good evening. I'm Rob Epstein, one of the governors in the documentary branch of the Academy. Thank you. Thank you. Along with my fellow governors, Alex Gibney and Kate Amend, I'd like to welcome you to our Oscar Week event, celebrating this year's nominated films in the documentary short and documentary feature categories. The Academy inaugurated the Documentary Award in 1942 to honor the films of 1941, and the first documentary to win an Oscar was Churchill's Island from the National Film Board of Canada. In the early years of the category, all the winning films had World War II as their subject matter. The documentaries nominated for the 87th Oscars cover a remarkable variety of subjects. The films in this year's documentary shorts take as their subject the beginning and ending of life. In one film, we have a filmmaker taking an intimate look at the compromised health of his own son. And another filmmaker depicts a young mother with cancer as she spends her final months with her husband and child. We meet the staff of a call center working to save the lives of suicidal veterans and we are introduced to a man who supports his family with a job at a slaughterhouse where he kills 500 bulls a day. And finally, we see the effects of a North Dakota oil boom on families and especially the children of its workers. So we'll begin tonight with the documentary shorts, and I'll be speaking with the makers of the five nominated films in that category. Uh, including filmmakers who have traveled from Poland and uh, Mexico City, uh, and I think New York City as well. Um, so thank you all for joining us. In the second half of our program, the wonderful Tabitha Jackson, my fellow host and the director of the Sundance Institute Documentary Film Program, will speak with the nominated filmmakers of this year's documentary features. So now let's look at the excerpts from the documentary shorts. So you're saying that you're, what you're telling me is that people have to do something drastic before they get help. That's what you're saying. I, I understand that you're in a lot of pain, that you're hurting. I understand that you can't work. I understand that you're having flashbacks. I understand that you're having repetitive dreams, night sweats. That's a lot of stress for one person. You want to be able to help your family. Do you have any weapons in the house besides yourself? Because I know that you told me you're your own weapon. No, Kenneth, you can't close this chapter. I'm not going to leave you. I'm not going to go anywhere. I'm going to stay right with you. If you cannot, if you can't tell me that you're not thinking of suicide, I will send an ambulance and a police officer and I will do a rescue. You're not telling me that you're gonna be okay. Can you safety plan with me? No, I'm, I can't do that, I'm sorry. You have five children, you have a wife, and you have a lot to live for, so He I'm is 46 sorry. years old, African-American. He refused to answer any safety questions. He did state that he was his own weapon. Uh, he is a former Marine. He might put up a fight. Can you, what's that? You're going to go in your closet? In the closet, on the floor. Tell me, tell me what's going on. Let's go slow. Can you talk to me about the images in the dark? Bodies are in the water. So the bodies are face down in the water. You can't help the bodies. There's too many. You know, it doesn't mean that you failed. Kenneth, Kenneth, let's slow down, okay? Kenneth, did you, Kenneth, did you do anything? Why are you breathing so heavy right now? Kenneth, what are you about to do? What's going on? 
I, I, you need to take care of your kids, Kenneth. You're their father. You're their dad, okay? No one can replace you, okay? No one can replace you. You're their father. You're going to be the one that they look for. I can't take care of your kids. I'm not a Marine. Their dad is a Marine. You know what that means to them? Give me that chance to help you. What's that noise in the background? You're going to let me talk to her? Okay. Hello, ma'am. This is Darlene um, calling from the Veterans Crisis Line. I um, was talking with uh, your husband, Kenneth. He was not able to report to me that he was going to remain safe. We are sending the police to talk with him. It's called a welfare check. I've been on the phone with him for over an hour or so. Are the police there yet? Ma'am? Hello? She hung up. The police are on scene. She said that they were on scene, but I didn't hear them. I don't know if they are, but she hung up. On scene? Okay, great. Thank you so much. They're there. They're there. Yeah. Thank you. No problem. Thank you very much. Are you okay? That was a long, very hard one. You know? Yeah. Be getting a hug with you one another. Thank you very much, honey. Co to jest dziecinada? Dziecinada? Hmm? To są jakieś zachowania, które są typowe dla dzieci. Hmm. Zachowania dziecięce. Dziecinne. Hmm? Dobrze, bardzo ładnie. Czekaj, ten trochę za Nie, ale to musisz trzymać ten kawałek. Nie możesz go kroić jak w powietrzu. Czasami dostaję na paduszału. To jest? No, czasami. Dostaję na pod usłyszał, jak wiesz, jak nauczycielka coś tam, jakiś program puści, ja nie mogę się skupić. Co wtedy robisz? Przeklinam po cichutku, kurwa. Naprawdę? Po prostu się denerwuję i tyle. A co to daje, jak się tak mówi po cichutku, kurwa? Po prostu jakoś mi drzej. Kiedy jesteś rozproszony, to o czym myślisz? Nad czym się zastanawiasz? Nad niczym, po prostu patrz tak, tak przez chwilę tak nic mam w mózgu, niczym nie myślę i tak ten mózg zaczyna myśleć i patrz jak się, i patrz jak się budzę. Jak się budzisz? No taki nieruchomy. I sam muszę zechcieć, żeby się poruszyć. A może wjedziemy do babci właśnie dla drżownic? Dla drżownic? Mhm. Możemy zawieźć drżownicą, oczywiście, jeżeli chcesz. To tutaj proszę wszystko ustaw. Okej, okay, a w ogóle czego ty się najbardziej boisz? W ogóle w życiu? Czego się najbardziej boję? Tak w życiu.
odpuszcza. Powoli. Tak? Przestaje boleć? Nie, jeszcze nie. Ale odpuszcza powoli. Chcemy nie tylko porobić, gdybyśmy pojechali do restauracji jakiejś dobrej. Do tamtych knajpy włoskiej byśmy mogli pojechać. To chętnie. Jakby była pogoda, to bym chciała na kajak, na grzyby bym chciała jeszcze. Jest znów na grzyby? Jakie znów dzisiaj nie było. <głos> I do tego, i do warzywniaka pójdziemy zobaczyć jak rosną rośliny. Przyjechał samochód, czy wiatr zawiał? Nie, wydaje mi się, że wiatr zawiał. Wiatr wiał. Hmm. Taki świat golą. Może nie będzie padało przez pół godziny. Mm -hmm. Już pada. Czujesz? Nie. Słyszę krople. Wydaje mi się, że jednak Pewnej nocy leżę sobie w łóżku, widzę, a tam za oknem się tukam z drzewa ułożył. Co wieczór się układa, ale najdokładniej się układa w zimę, bo jak są liście, to go bardzo, bardzo zasłaniają i tukam już znika. No i dobrze, i teraz tak. No, no. Nie. Zrelaksował się. Tak. 128 minut. Nie, to jest w domu. <laughs> to jakbyście Państwo mogli spojrzeć. Różni się respirator drobnymi szczegółami. Moment włączania to jest jak gdyby ej, przyciśnięcie przez dłuższą chwilę i on zaczyna się tam testować w tej chwili. Całe ustawianie jest podobne, jest proszę. Jakoś rolka się przesunęła, czy coś. Może mi bokiem wylatuje. No, zobacz jak tam jest robić.
Nie wiem, jak, jak to będzie potem dalej. Nie wiem, ja, znaczy, też nie wiem. Też się boję bardzo wielu rzeczy. Boję się wszystkich komplikacji, ale wiem, że dużo zależy od nas i wiem, że w zależności od tego, jak go prowadzimy, gdzie go będziemy rehabilitowali, jak lekarze go będą prowadzili, to naprawdę może być dobry. Znaczy Tomek, no wiadomo, że on będzie miał jakieś ograniczenia, ale po prostu ja nie dopuszczam opcji, że on będzie do końca życia zależny od respiratora. Będzie miał trochę, po prostu nie ma takiej opcji. Cuando empecé yo a, a trabajar este en, el, este en el rastro, mi primer día, no en la noche, no estaba, so, no estaba soñando que andaba este que trabajando que en el rastro. Entraban ese los animales y, y se, se me quedan viendo. Y lo que hubo, no, ahora te va a tocar a ti. O sea, ellos me veían así como si fuera el, o sea, el animal. No son sueños ese que tiene uno, pero por algo ha de ser, por algo son eso, eso es ese sueño. Cuando llegué ahí yo le puse a mis botas el, el, el o sea que el pinocho y ya llegó uno de allí y me dijo que no me dijo no no sabes que tú entonces tú vas a ser la parca y de ahí me empezaron a decir parca parca se me quedó ya hasta la parca de por asesino Sí le tengo miedo a la muerte. Sí. O sea, ¿por qué, por qué no se va a, tra a trabajar, no? Se va a trabajar y no sabe si va a regresar uno. Ya cuando le toca uno, ni, o sea, o sea, que se vaya a regresar uno a su casa. O, a, sí, ya cuando si, si no va a regresar uno, pues ya se quedó por ahí. Es cuando se le acaba este su... Cuando le llegaste la muerte a uno. Sí. Es como darle hasta la vuelta hasta el mundo. Porque, porque ya se muere uno y ya se le acabó hasta su mundo. O sea, ya no lo vuelvo a saber. Lo, lo es, es como dice la gente que, que hay, no que saque la gloria, que el infierno. Para mí eso es mentira. O sea, yo cuando me muero, o sea, ya se me acabó mi, ¿cómo no? mi mundo. Y el infierno es el que yo aquí.
arriba sí puede ser más fuerte. Pero por ya se anda abajo. Son más fuertes que uno. No hay porque están en el cajoncito, ya la. O sea, te las encierra. Ya en el cajoncito ya las puedes matar y todo. Y, y sí, sí puede ser más fuerte. Pero ahí arriba sí. Sí, pero, pero ya bajando ya no. No ya, no, ya abajo ya es más fuerte el, el animal que no. I don't get out much, and whenever I do get out, I don't even get near the stupid oil fields, because I know if I did, I'll probably just smell the gas and pass out. Burn the methane into the air. They say it's so efficient, but I thought methane was supposed to be pig farts. I mean, what I've heard from a lot of people is that the first natural gas comes from a pig's butt. building the pad for the oil fields. He makes the drill rigs places so they can, well, I don't know. All I know is he sits in a bumpy bulldozer all day. People, why should we just take all the beauty away from the landscape by putting up fires and making it smell horrible? All the guys want is money. But I don't know what happened if there was no oil fields. That's the only job that my dad ever worked in. El más grande punto de esto es cancelar todas nuestras deudas. Hay veces que pienso que ellos sienten que les venimos a quitar el trabajo, lo que es de ellos. Yo conversé con uno de los americanos acerca del problema, entonces dice, es ridículo. Ellos también vienen de Mississippi, de Montana, todos estamos aquí por el trabajo. El aceite está por donde sea y, y genera mucho trabajo y mucho dinero para las personas. Es un buen trabajo para el que lo sabe aprovechar. So the filmmakers could come up on stage.
So here we have to my left the filmmakers of Crisis Hotline Veterans Press One, Dana Perry, uh, producer, and Ellen Gusenberg, Kent director. <laughs> Joanna uh, Aneta Kopash, writer, director, editor. And, and please, if I mangle your names, correct me. Or if I mangle anything, you can correct me. But Our Curse, uh, Tomasz Szlewinski, writer-director. <laughs> and The Reaper, La Parca, Gabrielle Sara Aguayo, writer-director. <laughs> and White Earth, J. Christian Jensen, director, cinematographer, editor. So welcome to you all. All of your films have such um, an emotional effect, and they're done with such great sensitivity and insight and um, really a, a sense of poetics, too, every, every single one. And uh, just thank you for bringing these subjects to light, first of all. Uh, as a voting member in this branch, I really can't recall uh, a group in its entirety, being as solid as this one. So um, my memory is not all that great, but I think it's pretty apt. So uh, let's start with Ellen and Dana, Crisis Hotline, Veterans Press One. It's an astounding statistic to hear that veterans returning um, from the two wars that we've been fighting in the Middle East, on average, 22 veterans commit suicide every day. Astounding. So how did you come to this subject, and how did you find this, this particular crisis line center? Well, should I start? Sure. Um, well, I think the statistic is really the, uh, what impelled this film. I mean, it was, it was so outrageous. And uh, also, I think it, it's... Um, you knew of that statistic? We knew of that statistic. And, that, and uh, basically, driven by that, went to look for a story that could shed some light on what this was about and why, why it was happening and where it was happening and, you know, what some possible solutions might be. And after much investigation and study in all kinds of directions, you know, better in suicide, what about it? We did stumble across the hotline, and this seemed to be a microcosm of where it was really playing out day to day. Um, you know, in a very small place, there's just one hotline. And where is it? And it's in upstate New York, Canandaigua, in the Finger Lakes region. So all the calls from veterans go to this one place. And so we basically were embedded there uh, in order to tell the story that um, of what it really felt like for the responders who were taking the calls. You know, you never hear the veterans on the line for privacy reasons. So that was a little bit of a roadblock. But I think by hearing their story echoed by the responders, you know, it leaves one's uh, it leaves it open to our imaginations as to what the sort of isolation and suffering of uh, their returns might be. Yeah, Ellen, maybe you could speak to that challenge. I assume you went in knowing that you would never that we would never see the faces. Hear the these, voices. We just will hear the voices, nor see voices. identify a face or a voice. But the anguish is still so prevalent in the film throughout. How did you address that challenge going in? Um, you know, I remember we we spent we you know we we got access and we thought you know if we can make a film there it's going to be an incredible film because how do you address this issue of suicide and how do you raise awareness and try to offer something that's sort of preventive rather than spend time with grieving families which is another way you can do a film about suicide so. We went and we spent three days there, and um, I think we had a gut feeling, as much as we were terrified that we had no visuals, um, I think we had a gut feeling that these responders were extraordinary people. They were heroic in some great way, and that if we could you know, find responders who 
could sort of bring us into the emotion and the life and death sense of the call that we might be able to do this. Um, but we weren't sure. We spent, you know, three or four days there the first time we came back and we started to rough it together. And uh, HBO said, okay, do it, go for it. And we did. So the film plays as if it's a day. I mean, the, the kind of emotional experience of it, you're not really thinking about time. Right. You're so involved that you're just thinking you're there over the course of a day, which, of course, speaks to the craft of the film, that we're really not aware of what the, the time structure is. What was the actual shooting time that you were there? How long were you embedded there? Yeah, or over what time span? Think, yeah, over well, how many yeah, months? Yeah, it was about nine months. Uh -huh. uh, we right. went four about four days, four days at a time, time, and we made maybe about eight trips. Right. Um, and yeah, I mean, you know, I think that the sort of the decision about how to structure the film, we you know, we tried other things. We really tried opening the film up. We tried going home with people. We tried lengthier interviews. But in the end, the verite was what felt powerful to us. So we weren't trying to make it feel like a day, um, but we wanted it to feel like what it was like there. You know, there's the constant ringing of the phones, the never knowing what you were going to hear on the other end of the line. Um, and, and, you know, what's it like emotionally to be prepared for that day in and day out? Did a beautiful job. Thanks. Annetta. Yeah. <laughs> Joanna, so three-part question about Joanna. How did you meet her, and how much time did you spend with her filming, and did she ever have an opportunity to see any of the finished film before she died? Yeah. Uh, well, I met her through Internet somehow because I've just read an article about Joanna, and I was so fascinated with things that she was saying in this article that I learned that she was she was leading a blog. So I went there immediately, read the blog, and I was even more fascinated with the things that she was describing there and her writing style. She was actually a great writer. Was it about her illness? Was she writing about her illness in the blog? Was uh, she writing about being ill? Uh, I mean, she was describing the daily life, so the illness was also there, like, um, like everything. But she was so much concentrated on life and all on um, small moments and, and things that she was doing with her son and her husband, and there was so much love in it that I really, really uh, was fascinated with that. And then I just thought, like, uh, I wanted to meet her immediately. I wanted to... Um, to get into her world for a while, to stay there, and just to feel it, because it was, you know, so, um, yeah, so extraordinary to me. And then I just emailed her, proposed a meeting. She um, she replied me that okay, we can meet. But after like uh, two months later, she never answered to me. But I knew exactly when she was, you know, going, what she was doing, because I. Uh, kept reading her blog, so just one day I ran in, in, in the place that I knew exactly that she's going to be there, so I just um, catched her and said, here I am, <laughs> let's make a movie. She said, no, of course. <laughs> <clears throat> so then I just really had to take a last chance because I've done this movie on my mind already. There was no more, you know, I mean... Um, her no was like uh, destroying me completely. <laughs> so um, I just asked her, please give me just one minute, and I will tell you in this one minute how I feel your story. And after this one minute, if you say no, I will not bother you anymore. And uh, she said, okay, go ahead. <laughs> so I just said in one minute how I feel it, that I really want to make a movie about life, not about death and dying and cancer. And um, after this one minute, she actually never said uh, yes, but she didn't mention no anymore. <laughs> so two days after, we started. It was really um, immediately like we've started. And uh, what was the, the next question? Over what, what was the duration of time that you were actually ah, with yeah. her filming? Uh, we uh, spent uh, four months with her. 
uh, but a lot of time I spent out of camera with her, like um, being with her in in hospital and just um, just talking to her like girls talk, just to you know get into relationship because we didn't have any before, which is really um, not usual. You first should establish relationship, maybe even friendship with your character, and it was you know like quick start. And um, the last question was about if she had a chance to, to see the movie. Actually, she um, passed away um, a month before we've started editing. So the movie that we, we call the movie, I mean, the, the, rough, the, the cut that we call the movie now, she, uh, really, she didn't have a chance to see. But um, because I wanted her to trust me so much, so besides spending time with, with her, I also presented to her um, shooting uh, days, the, the material, which I wasn't supposed to do, <laughs> but I did. Uh, I, will, I, I was sure that she was uh, too, um, too smart to influence my movie, so I was really okay with that. And thanks to that, she saw like um, almost everything from, from the movie. Not in this you know, shape, but in some others, some before shapes. So, yes, actually, yes. Hmm. <laughs> the film, it's, it's also a beautiful tone poem. And I wonder if, if you always had that vision in mind. Did you ever think of the possibility of doing a more conventional narrative structure? For example, the way in which you reveal information, it just happens so organically. Actually, I saw the movie, I mean, I felt the movie like this from the very beginning. And it was kind of, you know, difficult to find a cinematographer for that because nobody believed me that, uh, come on, it's going to be about a young girl passing away, saying goodbye to her son. It's not going to be poetic or about life. It's impossible. So, uh, but finally, I mean, like... Two cinematographers said no because it's too um, too hard to me, and uh, now I'm very glad because at the end, Lukasz Jal, who is also nominated for Ida for cinematography, she agreed and he he did beautiful shooting, so beautiful um, cinematography. So um, actually, I saw it. I mean, like I felt this movie like this from the very beginning. Can you talk a little bit about your relationship with with your DP? How you achieved the look and the yeah. and the and the visuals? It was really great. Like uh, we understood each other from the first moment. I just explained how I see the movie, and he just finished. You know, <laughs> I was I started the, the sentence, and he finished. We felt each other so so well from the first moment, and then I was thinking like, oh my God, this is the man. He really understands my uh, vision. And of course, after every shooting day or even before and also during the shooting day, we've discussed the, um, the image um, for hours. And the most difficult thing was to, um, to be there and at the same time be not visible. And this is really the topic to, to discuss because you, you really need to hide and you need to spy. <laughs> This is the yeah that that was the idea to to make this movie to spy our characters, mm. not to shoot them. <laughs> you did it beautifully. Thank, Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Tomash, our curse. So you bring us into this very private, personal situation that's your situation and make us feel so privileged to be there but I wonder what it was like for you as both filmmaker and subject where there are moments at which you just felt this is too personal or too private to film or moments in the edit when you're looking at material where you felt it might be too personal or private why you would want to answer that question if it wasn't in the film I don't know but I thought it was worth asking <laughs> Well, thankfully, uh, during the filming process, we're just doing this together with my wife, Magda Hickel. So we are very safe. Is she here tonight? Yes, she's here. She's Welcome. Here. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> so we were quite safe. So we knew we can record anything. 
and then we'll see what's going out of it. Because like, I, I didn't even know it's going to be a movie out, out of it. You know, we were just filming, and I didn't know if I would like to share it. So I was not thinking whether it's too intimate or not. We were just filming, we were shooting ourselves. Uh, and then like, after a few months, we realized that, well, this story is kind of universal, and I think that, well, we should share our experience with others. And then came the hardest part, <laughs> which was the editing. Uh, and it was really hard because, like, well, I was editing my own story, <laughs> so I had to distance myself. But f straight from the beginning, I decided that I have to be as honest as possible with the story, so I didn't put any censorship. I really want to, like, reflect our emotions as closely as possible. So, no, there, there was no censorship during the filming. So, of course, we're thinking whether it's not, not too intimate or not, but then we decided, well, we have to go, like, either we, we for the full story or nothing. And what was, what was the impulse to film if at that point you weren't thinking about making a film? To be honest, I, I was the film worst of him, uh, in the worst of film school. It was during my first year of <laughs> school when Leo was born. And to be honest, I, I, I wanted to do the film, but I didn't really want to do as intimate as I did. So I was kind of encouraged by a very well-known uh, Polish documentary filmmaker. And at the beginning I said, no way, like it's, it's, it's too intimate, it's too private. I don't want to show my emotions to anyone. Because it was a really hard time for us. We really felt depressed, so we didn't want to let anyone know what's going on in our lives. But he said, well, you don't have to show it to anyone. Just try. So we did. So like, uh, we put the camera on, and like the core of our film is our couch conversations, which were before, so it was nothing special, which as you know, uh, turn on the camera like, uh, and uh, like acted the way we, we usually did. And, and well, the whole process of filmmaking really helped us a lot during that time. I don't know how we would manage to go through that time. So it was not the filmmaking, you know, that our energy could go into something mm -hmm. creative. We do not have to, like, fund depression or, like, you know, said how that our life... Because we really felt that our life ended at that time. We didn't see any hope. So, like, the film was the kind of kept us going on. Yeah, I was going to ask you, I mean, often in, you, you make a documentary and it's a form of catharsis, but that's after the fact. The catharsis happens when you finished it and, and you're, you're done with it. You realize in retrospect that it was somehow a cathartic process. You were, I told you last night there was a scene, the scene that wasn't in the clip tonight, but there was a scene where you and your wife are changing um, Leo's ventilator. Is it? it the the just tummy tube. It was a the, stomach tube. Oh, was that a yeah. stomach tube? Okay. Yeah. And it's, it's a, a moment that's both terrifying and heartbreakingly beautiful. It's just this paradoxical moment. And it was, it was that moment where I was wondering if having the camera there as part of your experience, if that was in a way to just kind of help you cope with the immediacy of what you were, you were dealing with. Well, that scene was really important for me. Like, this is... It, there's everything what we felt at that time, you know. The, uh, so it shows everything. Like the camera there, I, I don't know, we also like somehow forgot about it. So I think watching it all over again later was very cathartic, you know, editing and watching the film all the time, it gave us a new perspective, definitely. So I think the editing moment was the most cathartic. How did you know when to stop filming? It came very natural, really, like we're having one of these conversations. And then we realized, re realized that we like started repeating ourselves, that, <laughs> that we're done. Like, you know, we have to start living <laughs> as normally as possible, you know, that we, we cannot analyze all over what's going on. We have to live as normally as possible. So uh, it was natural just to turn off the camera because the camera was like this kind of, you know, the moment of... Mm, getting used to the situation. So when we finally somehow got used to it, we had to turn off the camera. So it really came very natural. And how is Leo doing? Well, he's doing really great. He just turned four in December, and he's a great little guy. Really. <laughs> and if anyone is interested, we have a blog. It's called uh, leoblog.pl, so everyone can check how's Leo doing now. With pictures? 
He had a lot of pictures, okay. and it's in English now. Oh, good. <laughs> okay, Gabrielle, the Reaper. So how did you find Efren? Is that his name? Um, and how did you go about getting him to participate in the film? I, um, I wanted first to find a big slaughterhouse. So I was finding the biggest slaughterhouse around Mexico City. This slaughterhouse is around two hours from Mexico City. And uh, when I got the permission to make the movie inside, I wanted to uh, interview some people. And I talked uh, with Efrain. I saw this guy uh, that was stand up in this kind of cage. And I saw him and I asked uh, the person, who is that guy? Who is that guy? He said, Efrain. And I want to go to speak with him. And then... Uh, well, I was speaking with him. I saw his face, and I said, he has an incredible face. And then he told me uh, one of the sentences that got me a lot uh, was, uh, when the bulls come to the cage, they feel death, and a tear goes by to them. So that was, for me, a very uh, poetic uh, way of uh, seeing his own job and very with a very detail. And also, he told me that he was he lost uh, his father and and sister, and I wanted to talk about death, about guilt and losses. So he was, I knew he was the right person. What was your initial instinct about shooting at a slaughterhouse, and how did you get permission to do it? And my first instincts, I spent two months investigating there and speaking with uh, Efrain, with the Reaper. I spent just talking with him. And um, I didn't bring any camera to the slaughterhouse. I was just there watching and writing a lot what I was seeing. And then with Carlos, that is the cinematographer that is here, we were like uh, building. Uh, we, we made two exercises before we made this movie. Uh, about uh, process in Mexico City in size uh, markets, big markets with meat. So we found that uh, the exact language to build this uh, world you know, inside in the atmosphere of a slaughterhouse. And uh, yes. The way you present it, the way I interpret it, Efren being so close to death on a daily basis, it's really take an emotional toll on him. Your experience being there, did it change your views at all, the time you spent in this in the slaughterhouse? Um, I don't know about my other colleagues here, but uh, I think I wanted to say uh, in the words of Efrain things that I think about life. And... Um, and it was very interesting to meet this person because um, I have, uh, in, the, in my past, I have been very close to many situations of that. So I wanted to find a person as me who was, who is like uh, this uh, kind of um, guy who um, owns the death or the or the life of of a, this in this case, an animal, no? a, a, be a beast, a bull. Sorry. So yes. A filmmaking question. The way in which you sound is so dramatic and unusual and impressionistic almost. Was that something you found in the construction of the film or was that already in your mind's eye as you were as you were shooting the film? And I don't think there's there's not there isn't any music in the film, is there? No, I um I I I was inside this place and I wanted to build an atmosphere. We found some library that we have before, and also the sound man, man, man went to very deepest places inside the solar house to get these uh, specific sounds. And uh, it was an incredible place because, uh, for example, for this movie, I wrote uh, the first scene that I wanted, the first that, w uh, that begins the movie, that is a hole where you see the cow coming and I found this hole in this place, and and I saw, yeah, this is the place. And also the sound, I was describing the sound when I was writing the movie before I went to look for the for the slaughterhouse, and I wanted this kind of atmosphere, and I found it also there. So it was a kind of dream. <laughs> Congratulations, beautiful.
Christian, White Earth. I have to tell you, I keep wanting to call your, your film White Balance, but White Earth. <laughs> what led you to North Dakota, to this subject, and particularly the character, the subject, the young boy who is not in school, clearly very bright. How did you come to both the subject and that particular young man? Um, I first heard about uh, the oil boom in North Dakota through my father. Um, I'm from southern Utah, and it was an area that was hit really bad by the economic downturn. Um, and a lot of people who were working in the housing markets uh, were out of work, and they were losing their own homes. Uh, and I started hearing from my father about how all these people were flocking to this, you know, this economic promised land, you know, North Dakota. It was very sort of Steinbeckian or something. Um, and so I, I was interested, and I, and I flew up there just sort of on a whim um, to kind of figure out what was happening. Um, and I knew from fairly early on that I wanted to look at this story tangentially. Um, I, I did not want to focus on or speak with the kinds of people that you would normally expect to hear from in a film about an oil boom. Um, and so I, I didn't want to be talking, you know, primarily with oil workers or, you know, oil company people. Um, and I've always been drawn toward children as a means of getting at something deeper, something that's perhaps less sugar-coated or gilded, because they really speak their minds. And, and you can sort of get a second-hand truth through children. Um, and often uh, they, they repeat the things that they hear, um, but they also you know, have their own autonomous thoughts. Um, and as far as James was concerned, the boy, uh, he was really the, when I found him, I, I, I knew that I had a film. That was the first point at which I was like, this, I, this can happen. And one of the things that I, I liked so much about him is that um, he doesn't just talk about, you know, pig farts. He talks authoritatively about pig farts. <laughs> and, he, and he speaks authoritatively about, you know, everything. And, and you know, within the, the confines of the film, what he says is truth. And he becomes the narrator for the film. Um, and, and I really liked that. And it wasn't really important to me at the end of the day whether or not what he was saying was true, because to him it was true. And, and that was, he's the one that sort of guides us through that world. I, I read somewhere that uh, Terrence Malick is a big influence for you. And knowing that, having read that, I can really see how you manifest that in your film. At what point did you see that? Was that, was that apparent to you? Um, I mean, definitely, I, I've, I have sort of, in, in, in my previous body of work, I've, I've always been drawn toward voices um, I, I, I haven't used uh, very often on-camera interviews. It's, it's just a stylistic thing that, that, has, that I, I am drawn, to, drawn toward. Um, and so, yes, I mean, Terrence Malick has always been a strong influence on my work. James Longley as well. His, his films uh, often use the same types of, of, of voices and characters. Um, but I, I think the film is sort of split into two different perspectives. One is, of course, the perspective of the characters, the children and, and the immigrant mother. Um, and, and I wanted those voices to reflect the thoughts and the, and the feelings and the opinions that they had about what was happening there. Um, but the second perspective of the film, which is the visual perspective, the landscapes, the interludes, is my own. Um, and that very strongly reflects the emotional um, response that I had when I arrived there. And, you know, to see these flames coming out of the ground and, you know, the lights in the distance. I mean, it really felt like this science fiction invasion, something post-apocalyptic. Um, and, and that is what I wanted to, to bring forth in the visual um, treatment of the film. My last question for you, uh, where did you stay? Uh, <laughs> lodging for a documentary filmmaker under the best of circumstances is yeah. a dodgy prospect. This did not look like the best of circumstances. Yeah. Um, well, I mean, it, it was a student film, so I was on a student film budget, um, which meant that I, I, did, I slept in my car at times. 
Um, I was very lucky. One of the on the the first time that I that I flew there, I ended up sort of randomly uh, at this uh, truck stop, trucker bar, um, and there was I, I walk into this room and there were all these you know definitely oil worker types you could tell, um, and there was a single woman in the room and it was this this little woman and she was behind the bar she was the bartender. Um, and I, you know, I spoke with her and she was so nice and so welcoming and she invited me to, to sleep on her couch and allowed me to come back uh, several times and, and just crash there. So, um, that was one of the ways that I was able to do it. Um, I did, uh, at, at one point, uh, spend some time in a man camp. Uh, so I felt like, I mean, I was only there for, compared to these oil workers, I was only there for a short period of time. Um, but it, it did help to get a sense of, you know, what they were going through uh, in, in my own attempt to survive there. Great. Well, I wish we could continue this conversation. <clears throat> As I'm sure everyone else does, but there's uh, another category waiting in the wings. So thank you for your stunning work. And please congratu- help me congratulate the short-nominated filmmakers. As Rob said, I'm lucky enough to be the director of the documentary film program at the Sundance Institute. Um, (laughs) I think that's my team from Sundance clapping. Um, But in hosting this Oscar-related event, I want you to think of me more as the Whoopi Goldberg to Rob's Billy Crystal. Um, it's for you to decide whether, in fact, I'm the Anne Hathaway to his James Franco, but we'll see, we'll see how it goes. We'll see how it goes. Um, so, you know, money's tight, but uh, it's an amazing time for documentary. Uh, nonfiction is the new reality. Uh, you can see it in cinema, on TV. There are f- new funders and supporters and curators coming into the market, Netflix being one, Amazon being another. And at least one of the entries we're going to talk to, I saw on a screen about this big, on the back of a plane seat, split across two transatlantic flights. And it was still brilliant. So we can see documentary everywhere and anywhere, and and it's fantastic. Um, And even fiction is trying to get in on the act, with half the nominees, I think, this year for Best Picture being based on real people. A theory of everything... Imitation Game, Selma, American Sniper. Um, Hopefully soon we'll see an actual documentary in the Best Picture category. Uh, There is an art to non-fiction. And from the 134 eligible submissions this year, we have here tonight the five that the voting members of the Academy feel best represents that art. So as we look at a clip from each of them, you'll see the difference in approach. You'll feel the difference in sensibility. And you will hear a diversity and a multiplicity of voices which represent our world and our culture. But for all those voices and all that difference, there is something that unites them, and that's the language of cinema. So let's take a look. Could you uh, pass me my magic uh, mantle of power? So. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Is that about the possibility of visual? Overhead? Yeah, visual collection. I don't think at this point there's anything in this regard that will shock us. <laughs> We've become pretty. In fact, you said before, he's like, he's like, I'm never leaving my room. He's like, I'm never leaving anything in my room again, not a single machine. I was like, you've been infected by the paranoia of the hug, and that was all of us. <laughs> and the yes. way he said it, he was like, I would never leave a single device in, that, in the room again alone. <laughs> my back is getting heavier and heavier. <laughs> That's your evil influence. All right, I'm going to need you to enter your root password because I don't know what it is. If you want to use this one, you're more than welcome. Okay. 
Oh, it looks like your root password's about four characters long. Anyway. It's usually a lot longer, but that's just like the one-time only thing, right? So it is... Uh, it had been a lot longer, but ever since I knew that it was just like a one-time only session one, I've been making it shorter. Is that not good? It, it's actually not. I was expressing this with, with Laura either. The issue is because of the fact that it's got a hardware MAC address and things like that, if people are able to identify your machine... And they're able to. This is the fact you're about to break the most upsetting story. Right. Yeah. That's true. That's true. So, so they might kind of prioritize. It's the ten letters. It's yeah. the, I type very quickly. It yeah. actually is ten uh, letters. Okay. So, so ten letters would be good if they had to brute force the entire key space. Right. Um, that would still probably only take a couple of days for an essay. Um, that's a fire alarm. Okay. I know, hopefully, it just sounds like a. Three second test, or is? Do you want to call the desk and ask? No. It's fine. Yeah, I don't think it's an issue, but it's interesting. That they Did that happen before? <coughs> Maybe they got mad that they couldn't listen into us via the phone anymore. Yeah, it's a fire alarm. Been off before? It's no, that's the first time that's happened. Yeah, see, so just in case they've got like an uh, alert that goes through. But uh, that's that's unusual. You're probably you might have to evacuate. Shouldn't right? ignore that. I don't know. Wait, if it goes, it's not continuous. It's not continuous. No, I'm just saying if it if it continues. And then we go and we meet the guys down in the lobby. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Yeah. Yeah. Let's uh let's let's, let's leave it for now. Let me uh, finish this up. Not that they're going to answer because they probably got like 7,000 calls. Yeah. Hi, uh, we hear a loud buzzing on the 10th floor. Can you tell us what that is? Oh, okay. Okay, great. Thank you. Bye. Fire alarm testing maintenance. That's yeah. good. Yeah. That's what we wanted to hear. <laughs> nice, of them to, uh, <laughs> nice of them to let us know about that in advance. It was winter, 2007. The auction house is across the street from my home. And I found this box that was loaded with negatives. I was writing a history book, and I needed a lot of historic photos. And so I would, like, you know, take the negatives, and I'd look up into the light, and I'd look for images of Chicago. There were several boxes that went with the set. I just went for the biggest one. I won it for, I think it was $380. The auction house told me the photographer. Her name was Vivian Meyer. Google search her. Nothing at all. I mean, absolutely nothing. So I just kind of gave up for a while. I looked at some of the stuff that night, and, and it was cool, but nothing worked for the book, so I just put it in the closet. Just had to figure out, what am I going to do with this stuff? That's what sparked me to start scanning it. I have a reflex or we'll be driving somewhere, and I'll just, like, spot something from down the road that I know what it is, and I know that it's valuable. I grew up doing the flea markets with my brother. My father did it. His father did it. I would do storage auctions with my brother, and he'd win some, and we'd clean them out. We threw out tons of negatives because there's no value in negatives to most resale people. In these negatives that I discovered, what I saw at first, I didn't know if it was really good. I knew that I thought it was good. I contacted a couple galleries. I didn't know where to go. I made a photo blog and I put about 200 images up.
on Flickr. That post, it just went insane. went on this mission to piece together the rest of her work. And then I found the other people who bought boxes, and I bought their boxes. And then I had all these negatives, like insane amounts of negatives. You always want to know who is behind the work. I just knew her name was Vivian Meyer. Is she a journalist, professional photographer. Uh, let me just Google her name again to see if there's anything up. And I found an obituary that was placed just a few days before that search. I found an address in her stuff. And after some, like, white page searches, I called and I said, I have the work with negatives of Vivian Meyer. And he's like, oh, that was my nanny. That was his nanny. Why is a nanny <laughs> taking all these photos? What they started to tell me about her was, was strange. But he said she was kind of a loner. She didn't have any family that we knew of. She never had any love life or children that we knew of. But she was like our mother. So it, it just caught my curiosity. My dad is afraid for not having enough fuel. Afraid for a lot of things. He was just flying blind. And then he saw a ship out there. In the middle of the day, after we had taken those first helicopters aboard, this huge helicopter called a Chinook, they came out and tried to land on the ship. Oh, we almost, the thing almost crashed on board our ship. This big Chinook showed up. There's no way you can land on Kirk without impacting the ship. He, he would have killed everybody on this helicopter plus my crew. It was way too big to land. We thought that the helicopter would just fly away. But as the ship was moving forward, probably four, five, six knots, something like that, the pilot communicated that he was running low on fuel. He opened up the port side of the helicopter and he hovered across the stern of the Kirk. Then all of a sudden, here comes a human. One by one, we jump out. I jumped out, my brother jumped out. My mom was holding my, my sister, obviously very scared. And she just, you know, just trustingly, just with one hand, with her right hand, holding on with her left to brace herself, you know, just dropped uh, my baby sister. One fellow standing there and he said he looked up and he saw this big bundle of stuff come flying out and it was a baby. It was the one year old baby. And then the mother jumped out, and he caught her, too. Then the pilot flew out on our starboard right side. He hovered with his wheels in and out of the water. He hovered there for like 10 minutes, and we couldn't figure out what he was doing. It turned out what he was doing was taking his flight suit off. And here's a man flying a twin rotor helicopter by himself. At the same time, he's taking off a flight suit. How you do it, I, I've talked to helicopter pilots and they can't figure out how he did that, you know, how, how, like a Houdini trying to get out of this thing. And finally, he made the helicopter roll to the right as he stepped out the door on the left. Just thunderous, loud noise, the shrapnel's just blowing up. And suddenly, just quiet. And he pops up, and he's alive. And he swam away. 
The helicopter was only about 20 feet from him when it hit the water. It was amazing. We went out, picked him up. He was none, no worse for the wear. He was a little bit wet. Well, one unfortunate thing is he had some small bars of gold, which was all his worldly possessions, that were in his shirt pocket that sank. So he lost everything. He didn't, he didn't own a thing but his underwear when he finally came aboard the ship. He was a, a tremendous pilot. The guy was just so cool and calm. We've so far taken a total of 17 helicopters. We ended up with 157 people aboard the ship. That crew was very special. They went, they took their money, went to the Navy Exchange and Commissary, bought all the clothes, the food they could get, took it up and gave it to the refugees they befriended. They were unbelievable. We laid mats and all kinds of blankets and stuff out on the deck for the babies, and there were all kinds of, there were infants and children and women, and oh, it was a, it was a scene I'll never forget. We were happy. My mom was just, you know, wow. Symbolically, it was like you know, the first step onto not American soil, but American freedom. film about the life of a photographer maybe it's good at the beginning to remember where the word comes from in Greek photo meant light Raph was writing drawing a photographer is literally somebody drawing with light a man writing and rewriting the world with lights and shadows Serra Pelada, na mine d'or do Brasil, en face de moi. Quand j'arrivais au bord de cet immense trou, tous les poils de mon corps ont monté. Je n'ai jamais vu une situation pareille. Là, j'ai senti dérouler devant moi, à quelques fractions de seconde, l'histoire de l'humanité, l'histoire des constructions de pyramides, la tour de Babel. Les mines du roi Salomon. On n'écoutait pas le son d'une seule machine là-dedans. On écoutait seulement les murmures de 50 000 personnes dans un grand trou. Les conversations, les bruits, les bruits humains mélangés avec cette touche manuelle. Vraiment, je suis venu au début du temps. Je sentais presque le murmure de l'or dans l'âme de tous ces gens. Il fallait jeter toute cette terre. Tout, c'est pas l'or. Les mecs, il fallait qu'ils grimpent dans tout ça, qu'ils partent, qu'ils montent ces petits escabeaux, qu'ils arrivent sur des grands escabeaux et qu'ils sortent là-haut. Ah, tu n'as pas beaucoup d'intérêt à tomber là. Et si on tombe en haut, il risque d'amener quelques-uns avec. Là, j'ai monté ça plusieurs fois par jour. Mais jamais même passé dans la tête que je pouvais tomber non plus, parce que personne ne tombait non plus. On n'était pas là pour tomber, on était là pour transporter des sacs ou pour faire des photos, comme dans mon cas.
Les mains qui montaient ça 50, 60 fois par jour. La seule manière que tu as de descendre en plan incliné comme ça, c'est en courant. Si tu arrêtes, tu tombes. Tous ces gens ensemble, ça faisait un monde hyper organisé, mais dans la folie totale. On a l'impression que ce sont des esclaves, mais il n'y avait pas un seul esclave. S'il y avait d'esclavage là, c'est de l'envie d'être riche. Tout le monde voulait être riche. Et là, on trouvait de tout. On trouvait des intellectuels, on trouvait des, des mecs avec un diplôme universitaire, comme on trouvait des, des employés des fermes, des travailleurs urbains. Il y avait de tout qui venait chercher ici, une possibilité. Parce que quand on touchait les filons d'or, tout le monde qui participait dans ce petit morceau de la mine avait droit à choisir un sac. Et dans ce sac que la personne avait choisi, c'est là, là l'esclavage. Il pouvait rien avoir comme il pouvait avoir un kilo d'or. C'est à ce moment qu'il jouait son indépendance. Tous les hommes quand ils commencent à toucher l'or, ne reviennent plus. If I just struck out, just next to us. I don't know. I don't know if we're doing the right thing. où ils nous disent de remettre les armes. Ouais. Il faudra ouais. réagir très vite et cacher les armes. Que s'ils nous disent de remettre les armes, moi je les, je dis, je dis, je les connais très bien. Là, ça sera encore très pire. Mmh. Parce qu'il faut essayer de dissimuler les armes. Ici, 
de maintenir la station et qui est là pour le parc. S'ils viennent ici, nous ne pouvons pas les combattre. Moi, je serai le dernier à quitter Romangabo. L'armée congolaise est en train de déployer autour de la station. Many people left Erumangabo, but for me, I felt obliged to stay with gorillas here. You must justify why you are eh, on this earth. Gorillas justify why I am here. C'est ça ma vie. Donc, s'il s'agit de mourir, je dois mourir pour, pour les gorilles. Never seen documentary filmmakers look so smart. Um, one of the things I wanted to say, just while you're you're taking your seats, is, um, you know, if the if the language of cinema is is sound and imagery, this projection is spectacular, isn't it? And it it just looks incredible. <laughs> Stuff looks amazing. Um, I also wanted to say that earlier I was introduced to the voice of God um, and I was delighted that my theory is right. God is a woman. <clears throat> so uh, <laughs> when I was asked to do this, I was absolutely delighted and um, I was told that I'd have 25 minutes to talk to you about your films and I thought... How am I going to how how am I going to talk to Vin Vendors about his career and his work in 25 minutes? How am I going to talk to Laura about the state of U.S. surveillance and uh, how to combine journalism with art? And I'm not. It turns out it's 25 minutes for all of them. So we're gonna we're gonna do this. It can be like a challenge. It can be like the five obstructions. Um, and and someone at work told me to consider it like speed dating. I'm 44 and I'm still single, so I don't know if that's a good trajectory to go on. But let's, let's try it. Um, also, the Academy is scrupulously fair, so you'll see that the clips were played in alphabetical order. The nominees are seated, their projects are in alphabetical order. But we're Sundance, so we're going to break the rules. We're going to be a bit independent, and I'm going to go in whatever order I want. Also, I want to keep you on your toes. Um, earlier, I sent round a question. After we met last night, Orlando, you said that um, you'd just done an interview and someone had asked you a question which nobody had ever asked you and you really wanted someone to ask you. And it just gave me a thought that in the seconds that we have together... Um, there might be a question that that uh, that no one's asked you, and and I could ask you instead. And and so I don't know what they might be, or whether you had a chance to see that email or think about it. I do know Rory Kennedy. 
I do know something about your answer. I wonder if you would just relay what you just said to me outside. That I said to you very privately. Um, so thank you, Tabitha, for making me do this. No, I... I <laughs> Are you really going to make me say this? I said I come from a political family, so any question that is asked to me, I answer in the way I want to answer it. I don't really pay attention to the question. So I, there's no question that I haven't answered in the way I want to answer it. <laughs> right. Um, so let's start with you. And uh, you are here with Kevin McAllister. Um so, I mean, the clip that we saw is is absolutely phenomenal, and I think it might be worth spending a little time on that. Kind of preface by the thought that um, the style of filmmaking that you're using for this film is a very traditional style of interview, beautifully shot by Joan Churchill, and archive. And one of the things that people sometimes say about documentary cinema is that it's cinema in the present tense. And I, I was amazed by how you'd managed to take this piece of history and make it seem like it was unfolding in front of our eyes and just watching it again there. Can you talk through some of the elements that you used to make that work? Because it's rich and layered. Um, well, thank you for, for that compliment. I think um, we were working with a very strong story. And I think of all the films that I've ever made, it had the strongest narrative and the, and the kind of most natural narrative arc to it. And um, I, I think it felt to us that the best way to tell that story is um, in a more traditional way so that you don't have kind of the style get in the way of the story. Um, and so, you know, we we use pr traditional methods in certain, in certain ways, but there's no narrator in the film. There are no historians in the film. It's very much... Um, telling the story as it unfolded in time and what the characters know who we're documenting um, at that point is what the audience knows. In other words, we don't provide any insights that we have looking back at it before they know it in the time of when it occurred. And I think the combination of those elements is along with, you know, Don Clezzi was an extraordinary editor and, um, and, and Gary Leonelli is here um, with a, a really amazing score and I think the sound made, it, it made a difference as well in the film. And I think that helped. And I really great writing by the part of Kevin McAllister and Mark Bailey to construct it so that I hope that audiences feel that, you know, you're a little bit at the edge of your seat of what's going to happen next. And, and then not only do you, do you imagine it and you feel it, you see it, or it seems that we are seeing that unfolding in front of our eyes. How did you come across that? Well, one of the most astounding things that we found as we were making the film was this incredible trove of Super 8 footage that someone on the, the ship had actually shot. And the story of finding that, um, Rory can tell better than I can because she sort of uh, discovered it at a screening in New York. Um, yeah, I was. I, uh, we were doing a screening in my previous film, and there was a, um, a guy who worked at the U.S. Department of the Navy, and I had talked to him about this, the film and how I really wanted to profile the story of the Kirk. And he came back up to me uh, about an hour later, and he said, you know, I, I, I was thinking about what you were saying, and there was a guy – um, who I met a few months ago who had mentioned that he had been up in his attic and had uncovered a box of Super 8 footage from the Kirk in 1975, and would you have any interest in that? And, um, and it was, it was he, I then called him the next morning very early, and, um, and he was very protective of his, of his footage. I was in back in California, and he wouldn't FedEx it out here, so we flew him out here with the footage, and we transferred it, and it was just a treasure trove. So, actually, that story, and there were a number of stories. We we wrote a treatment of the film before we made the film, and there were a number of stories that we had anticipated wanting to show in the film, which he actually had filmed, including the, the story that we shared tonight, the Chinook story. So he filmed part of that story and a, a number of other um, pretty dramatic moments in the film. And, uh, you know, often with documentary, even when set in the past, they illuminate the present somehow because there's a universal quality to them. But 
in this case, there are specific resonances, presumably, that you can you can make with what's going on now, although you don't have to do them, you know, you don't have to bang the nail on the head, as it were. And if you could speak to that, that a little, and also the importance to the population of Vietnamese Americans that we have in the country. Well, what was stunning to me, uh, uh, Rory can speak to this too, um, was just sort of how little we learned from that experience in terms of our foreign policy and getting into uh, situations where we don't have a clear exit strategy or even an objective going in. And um, we sort of thought of that as we were developing the film, but it became more and more clear as situations in Afghanistan and Iraq unfolded. Um, One of the most rewarding things for me in having the film come out over the last year is sharing it with audiences and particularly um, members of the Vietnamese community. And it's, um, you know, I think that for so many of them, there hasn't, they don't feel that in this country there's been a recognition of what they went through at this time in history. And so... um, it's it's been a pretty profound experience, and I think for many of them, I mean, we we lost a war, but they lost their country in this moment. And to um, and many of them came here and wanted to move on and haven't really talked about it. For the older generations, the younger generations don't have a real appreciation of what their parents went through, and then they see the film, and there's this this uh, kind of extraordinary thing that happens where they. Um, and and I mean I it's rare that I've had screenings where I don't leave not weeping because of the stories that they tell um, of you know not only many of them I mean I've had screenings for example in New York where people have said oh my God I saw myself in the footage outside of the embassy and you know but beyond that there's a kind of a reconciliation of what they went through and an understanding of what their parents went through for the first time which is pretty profound and moving. I think it's incredibly powerful. I'm looking at the red light because I've asked Rose to tell us when our date is up. I would very much like to see you both again. (laughs) Let's just start. I enjoyed it. Okay, great. Thank you. Thank you. So now I think I'd like to move to Charlie and Finding Vivian Meyer because this is another film which, which, uh, which is set in the past to a large extent, but in this case, is framed through the lens of the present. Um, John Maloof, your co-director, I understand, taught himself photography and filmmaking in order to participate in this project. And this is your your directorial debut. I've yes. been doing this for 25 years. It's really annoying. <laughs> <laughs> what I mean is congratulations. Thank you for saying that. Thank you for saying that. Well, I had, I had very good teachers. I... Uh, I started out working with Michael Moore as a, as a producer, and um, so I have been at this for some time, uh, working in, doc- in the documentary world where the lines between producing and directing, in my experience, are, are sort of blurred. Um, I came from the school of do it yourself, um, roll up your sleeves, and uh, get done what needs to get done in order to make, to make the film, everything from raising money and um, the producing and gathering of the story to the writing and the storytelling and uh, and the directing. So, um, so I've, I've had good teachers. And this is an extraordinary story. And it, it also, you know, documentary filmmakers are serious people. We wear suits. The world is going to hell in a, in a handbasket and there are important things to be done. But also we need some entertainment. And I think what this film is, apart from being an incredible story and a detective story, is it's very entertaining. We can tell from the clip the use of music, the tone, the humour in it, the way that you've put one of your directors, John, as the protagonist, in the cent- literally in the centre of the frame. I just wonder if you can talk a little about how you came to that tone. Uh, well, uh, thank you. Um, I, I think um, documentaries should be entertaining. Um, uh, we're asking people to uh, go and see uh, a film in a theater, and um, so uh, it is different uh, from journalism in a fundamental way. Um, uh, the job, I think, is not just to uh, recite the facts. It's to recite those facts and put them together in a compelling way, in a way that tells a story. Uh, my favorite documentaries do that. 
Um, so um, even ver verite documentaries, um, going back to the first d documentary that appeared in uh, theater, Salesman, um, it has a protagonist. It follows a group of traveling Bible salesmen, but um, the Maisels had the good instincts as storytellers to f identify one who seemed to be going through a, a crisis um, and, uh, and latched onto that as a, a storytelling device um, that tells us something about the world and about ourselves. So in this case, uh, the, the story that we were telling was of uh, a discovery, a discovery of an artist who was masquerading as a nanny. She uh, lived a double life, really. Um, Vivian uh, was known to the world throughout her life um, as a domestic worker, um, the help. Uh, but she was harboring this secret. And so um, in telling the story of her discovery, John finding her work and then sharing it with the world, we wanted the audience to feel like they were making that discovery alongside John. That's certainly how I felt when I first saw her work and when I first learned about the story. Um, I, was, uh, I was inspired by it. John, as you mentioned, was so inspired by her work that he took up photography himself. He had never shot photographs, uh, and ended up shooting the film. Um, and he's a very quick study and um, I think has a bit of uh, the obsessive traits that, uh, that Vivian has uh, herself. And, and, um, and you have to uh, be a bit obsessive um, about your story and, uh, and because you work for three and a half years telling it and um, without the promise of any reward from it. So, um, and Vivian was certainly familiar with that herself. She worked for five decades um, creating these images without the promise that they would ever be seen, uh, but she continued to do the work. She did the work of an artist um, without the, the promise of recognition. Um, and uh, I mean, the, t the title is, is uh, almost provocatively called Finding Vivian Meyer. Do you think you found her? Well, I, I think what we um, found was uh, the answer to a riddle, I guess. Um, I don't know if, um, if that means uh, having found every uh, you know, dark corner of Vivian's life. That was never the, the aim. The goal wasn't to shine a light into private areas of, of her life. Um, the goal was always to sort of fundamentally understand her. How was she able to lead this double life um, and produce the work of a great artist and yet never have it seen? What, what allowed her to keep, uh, to keep going on? And um, I think the answer to that riddle was ultimately that she was an artist through and through. Um, uh, that's what artists do. And uh, being a nanny was really um, the thing that just allowed her to do that. It was a means to an end. Um, and what was challenging in terms of the storytelling was that, you know, Vivian wasn't known as an artist during her lifetime, so we couldn't turn to contemporaries. We couldn't turn to galleries that represented her work or people who, um, who knew her as an artist. These people who populate the film fundamentally misunderstood Vivian. So we have a portrait of Vivian as told through the eyes of people who really didn't understand her at all. And I think um, that was a problem initially in terms of the storytelling, but it, it ended, up, ended up kind of containing the solution to a lot of our problems because I think it gives you a sense of what it felt like for Vivian to be uh, living this double life, living a lie, really, and keeping her light under a bushel throughout her life. Um, and it, of course, makes it all the more poignant that the work has now been found and shared with the world. I think, as an artist, that was her, her hope and her ambition. It, it was, wasn't realized during her lifetime, um, but it's, it's happened uh, it's happened now. And that's, a, the, ooh, our date's nearly up, but that's, a, that's, you know, part of the responsibility of the, of the documentary filmmaker. You, you could, it, that could be a massive presumption that was wrong on your part, that she wanted that to happen, but it, it feels that within the film you, you embrace that possibility and explore it and allow us to feel okay with, with you literally going through her things because you, you are illuminating something that she, she wanted. Is that a fair 
summation. Yes, and I, that's right. I, and um, and I and we welcome the debate and the discussion about that. It's in the film. We have a, one of the people in the film says Vivian would have hated this. Um, so it's uh, it's very much um, a, a source of kind of conflict and tension that we want uh, in the film. I think that ultimately um, we did get. Vivian Wright, but um, you know, I think uh, as human beings, we are fallible. I think we tend to get one another wrong more often than not. Um, but I think that that's a complexity I, I can I can live with and embrace. Fantastic, thank you. I thank would you also... for watching it on the flight. No, <laughs> two flights. How did you know it was yours? Um, I would like to see you again, but I don't want you going through my drawers. <laughs> Fair enough. Thank you very much. You. So d- that leads me on to another film about another photographer trying to find a person. It could have been called Finding Sebastio Salgado, but it isn't. It's called Souls of the Earth, and it's absolutely uh, stunning. I, mean, I think this, this sense that, it, you know, in this case, the person you are finding is still here, he's, he's alive, that this is another project, actually, with two directors... One of them is his son, and the other one is Vim Vendors. My first question is, how much therapy did your editor need? <laughs> we are the odd couple. <laughs> and our editor was young and inexperienced, and that helped. <laughs> could, you, could you tell us, I'm sure this is something you have rehearsed a lot, but just tell us how it how you both came together and how you were able to shape one singular vision from two very different perspectives and different experiences. The one thing we knew when we started the film was that, I mean, Sebastio is a a well-known photographer. His photographies have been around. But actually something that hadn't been, um, you know, that no one knew about, apart from the friends, the family, was that he actually had had a lot of very unique experiences, had learned a lot about the people he had met, you know, in the places he was photographing. And there was a lot to share with these stories. So when we set up to do this film, we actually wanted to do a film that was not going to be about a photographer, but about one of the great witnesses of the last 40 years. We actually never shot anything together. Juliana shot on the journeys, and I shot interviews, and I shot in Brazil on the Instituto Terra, where he does the reforestation things. And we only started working together when we were editing. And it was a disaster. Not easy. (laughs) I can tell you. It was not easy, because I had never done this, and he had never done this. And we soon realized that we both could make a movie, easily. uh, But we also had a hunch that the movie that we could possibly make together would be better than each of the films that we could do. After a year of editing, <laughs> that hunch, you know, yeah. And then we did the unthinkable. We started editing each other stuff. And that was the most painful thing in my life. <laughs> 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 but we, we, we survived it, and Actually, we did make the film that we both dreamt was in the material. Can you tell me, it, it, it's interesting because I've read that you you started with one approach and then you went back and, and reconsidered. And something that we saw in the clip was the very interesting way in which Sebastian is framed, as it were, looking at us, but also looking at his own imagery. Can you just talk about how you got to that? I started, frankly, the film without much of a concept. We just just wanted to get to know him, and we did lots of interviews, very conventional. I was with him in the shot. We talked to cameras for for days and actually weeks until I knew everything, and at the end I knew this was not the film. Now I knew his work, but the precious moments were always when he forgot that there was two cameras and that he was talking to me when he really vanished in his photography. And I finally told the producer, now... Don't you think we're finished? We now start from scratch again. Because I knew all the stories. I knew how great a storyteller Sebastian was. And then I came up with that idea of a dark room 
where he didn't see anything else in front of him than his picture, no cameras, not me. And the picture was projected on a teleprompter, except that there was no text, it was his photograph. He could look at his photograph, talk about it, and look at us, the audience, at the same time. And my only job, because I now knew a little bit the context of everything, was to give the rhythm and feed the photographs, and every now and then ask a question, but he didn't see me. And it became a very intense process where he really would di was diving into his memories. There's an, I had an incredible experience when he was looking at his imagery and I was looking at his imagery at the same time and our eyes were moving. We were both drawn to the, to the same part of the image. And the, the connection with a subject through a screen was I've never quite experienced anything like that. It was a, it was a remarkable thing. I, I, Juliana, I wanted to ask you, as you were, we are with you as you film your father taking still photography, and obviously you are filming him with a motion camera. The dynamic to me is fascinating of, of firstly, the competition between the cameras and framing, and secondly, the, the competition, maybe, between father and son. Can you just talk a little bit about how those shoots were? Yeah, Sebastian actually absolutely hated to have someone filming around him. <laughs> He felt, you know, the subject were actually attracted to the moving camera and he couldn't contact, you know, the people that he was, you know, trying to, to get close to. And um, at some point in Papua, I had to start filming with a long lens, um, you know, 180 with a 40, so it was like suddenly 320 was very far away because he needed to be on his own, you know, to connect with the subjects. And I have to say that I felt when I set up to do those trips that I was actually going to meet my father. And that's where we were going to, you know, have chats and embrace each other. You know, we had a complicated relationship at first. And actually it happened when we were starting the edits, all those dark room shots, uh, sequences. Of course, I know, I knew all these stories by heart, but suddenly watching the stuff that Vim had filmed... Um, together, two hours and a half of footage. Suddenly, you know, I, I really understood something from, from Sebastio. All those things that he had witnessed, all those very important moments, all this pain that, that he suffered, and, and how much he had to elevate himself to keep going, and also how much he was hurt by, its, you know, by, by the last stories that he covered during the, the Rwanda genocide and the balance that he found afterwards. I mean, all of that was there, and I, I was so close, you know, to the story that I couldn't see it. And actually, I needed someone else to, to come in. And I was the family therapist. Yeah, you get it, absolutely. We needed a, a family therapist, you know, uh, to come help us. And actually, it happened there that we met through, you know, Vim's, um, I don't know, eyes, gaze over Sebastian. And it's very bizarre because when you have this troubled relationship with a father and suddenly you understand a few things, these things like magic. It's suddenly when you meet him again, you're friends. And that's what happened to us. And it's, it's for me, as far as I'm concerned, uh, it's been a great adventure for that, not for the editing. It was a nightmare. <laughs> Is there a, was there a question that, that uh, no one has asked you that you'd like to answer? Yes, there was one. Good. <laughs> Moving on. The, it's funny, but the simplest question never got answered, never got asked, which was, how did you think still images could become moving images? Nobody ever asked me that, and I'm quite happy about that. That's great. That's tantalizing. I'm not going to do it because the red light's on. Um, I was so shy last night that I couldn't even say hello to you. So thank this has been a wonderful first date with both of you. Thank you. So some of the themes that came through very, very strongly um, in The Salt of the Earth were themes to do with, with Africa uh, and with conflict and those themes are also present in Virunga, Orlando and Joanna your your film which is 
which again is a really remarkable film. And we we saw the clip there. I mean, for those people, it's on Netflix, which is great, which means you can just go home and watch it. But for those people who haven't seen it, do you want to just tell us a little about the, the context of that clip? What was going on? So, um, so that that was a, a very very scary moment. There was a well, when 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 we first, I mean, we set out to make a very different film. We set out to make a film about it was a positive story from Congo, a, a country that you really don't hear very many positive stories from. And it was this story about these rangers trying to rebuild the country after 20 years of war. And it was it was it just really spoke to me um, because it was so different to all the things I'd read about Congo and. On almost the first day of getting there, we learned that there was a British oil company illegally exploring for oil in the park. And within a couple of weeks, a war started. And we realized that what we were seeing in this park was sort of a microcosm of a much bigger process that had been playing out in Congo for the last 130 years, effectively characterized by foreign interests coming and taking the country's resources and the end result being very bad for, for Congolese people. And... Anyway, this, this, this war got worse and worse. And in the clip, this was in July 2012, this rebel movement was moving down through the park and they were about to hit the, the headquarters where, where most of the families of the rangers were and you know, it was a big village community. And um, the management of the park evacuated as many core staff as they could and all that was left was a key group of rangers and the carers for the for the mountain the orphan mountain gorillas that, that lived there as well and um you saw just it just ended just before the rebels actually get there so uh, i know that not all filmmakers like to think of themselves as artists but when i think of when i think of an artist it's someone who who um we were talking about this the other day who who puts a framework around something in the world they notice something in the world and they put a framework around it and through doing that and through using the imagination it unlocks some meaning for us and it just as you're in the middle of a chaotic unfolding situation how in the edit did you make sense of what you got because you didn't go out there to get that well, I, I mean, it was a it was it was a nightmare to edit this film. Um, I, firstly, it's it, I, I'd never made a feature film before. And we were both newcomers to this, um, and and also we almost had three types of film. We had this kind of journalistic investigation. We had a sort of National Geographic uh, nature documentary, and then this kind of verite war war movie. Um, so tying all those together coherently seemed was was really daunting and a lot of people were saying we should actually try and split these up into two different films there could be a pbs frontline and then a kind of more character focused story but but we always felt that all of the different characters we were following and all the different themes they all tied together and they all affected each other in real life and so to key to making this film was to try and combine them all into something coherent and um and, and true and now it feels like the film has a real purpose and Jana I wonder if you could talk to the the purpose and, and what you want to do with the film yeah I mean I it, it, it was actually you know Orlando's real vision from the beginning and I came on late but from the very first moment I met him he had a purpose for this film and it was really very much more than you know making a great film and, and showing it to the world it was really to try and affect change on the ground and to try and protect this park because most people didn't know what was happening there not least the war, but, but actually what was happening with the British Oil Company. And so together we tried to, to find a way to actually get it to the most amount of people. And, and I think everybody agrees that Netflix is that way, you know, 53 countries. But also to actually get it to a, a small group of decision makers that could actually do something about this, both in Congo and outside and to realise that film really can make a difference, and it's starting to make a difference. We have a long way to go, but the film is, is really definitely helping those civil society groups that have been working on this for years and receiving death threats and worse for, for this kind of work. So we have a, smart, a small part to play in, in really supporting their fight. And it, it feels good that, uh, that you came on as producer, because Orlando, I know you were kind of doing this as so many filmmakers do, you, you started off funding this yourself, is that right? 
Yeah, to be, to begin with. I mean, this it was a very difficult film to get funded because because no one had heard of me, of me, for instance, and and also it was. Um, we were, you know, we 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 were so careful about this. the investigative angle. We were so careful to not let anyone know what we were doing because there was a lot of very dangerous and powerful people who who who, you know, anyone who's spoken up and on the ground in Eastern Congo and showed opposition to oil has received death threats. They've been beaten up. They've been tortured and and, and you know possibly murdered. Um, and and so we didn't tell anyone that. We'd go to pictures and we'd say, oh, it's this film about. Gorillas and um, and a lot of people saw right through that. And like this film doesn't sound right. Um, I have to say, at that point, though, you know, there's one organisation that's really responsible not only you know for the for the start of this film, but also of Laura's, and that's the the Brit Doc Bertha Journalism Fund. You know, I don't think either of us. I don't know Laura if you agree, but we'd even be here without Absolutely. them. Absolutely, and they were the first. They were the first funders for my film, for and also no proposal. As we said it was also secret. I think it's a new strategy. We just. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, there we go. For pictures for, from filmmakers to say it's really super secret. Uh, what was your... Um, I know your question because you said last night, but what was the question that, that someone hadn't asked and you were glad that they did? Well, the, the, one, from, I mean, the one from last night was... Um, some, it, was a, it was a radio journalist and she said, oh, you know, you've, you've made a film about gorillas, but five million people have died in, in Congo. Is, is that ethical? And um, and actually, this this film was never about gorillas. This was always about people. Um, the gorillas in the film, they sort of serve a, 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 um, well two roles. I mean, first they're amazing creatures. They have a um, just looking into their eyes. It's hard to not see this this connection. And, and they they bring a, a lot of heart to the film. And also, one of our characters, he um, he has he's a carer for orphan mountain gorillas. There's only a handful of people in the entire world who do this. Um, and he. He just was, he sort of bucked every possible stereotype that there might be about Congolese males and just such, one of the most incredible people I've ever met in my entire life. Um, I'm actually even emotional just talking about him. But um, so this, this film wasn't, yeah, it wasn't about gorillas. It was, it was sort of using them in a way to, to bring in a much wider audience. Um, and really it was a telling a story about, about Congo. Fantastic. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you very much. So, Laura Poitras, Citizen Four and the Citizen Four team, Dirk, the producer, and Mathilde, the editor and producer. But Laura, as we heard, director, cinematographer, sound recordist, as Orlando was, People are trying to make a living in this business. Are you just some kind of control freak that you have to do everything? <laughs> tell us how that... I'm obviously being facetious, but tell us about that and the way you like to work generally. Um, it, you know, I mean, I think one of... The, in all of my work, one of the things I've been able to do... There's both. There are times where all of it has been about a collaborative process, and so working with Dirk and Mathilde and bringing people in, but then there are also times where you, I feel like I want to sort of explore what's happening and have just be really patient and have a lot of questions and doubt and actually not have a lot of answers. And that's easier to do for me to do it when I'm going into the field alone. Then I can just shoot a lot and then try to find the story, and then once I kind of have a handle on that, that's when I tend to bring in more people for the collaborative process because usually at the beginning it's really, you know, unformed and and i want to be able to find that um and so so i like to shoot alone in the field it it it, it works for my style of filmmaking and uh, we've seen how you know we've seen how documentary can be a time machine and it can take us to vietnam in 1975 we can see how it's how it can be an empathy machine uh, through someone like salgado who is about it seems trying to get to the human condition and we can experience that through his images this film is of a ver very specific moment. It's of a very specific time. It has qualities that are that are more universal. But I wanted to ask you, Matilda, as an editor, and it's great to have an editor here on the stage, just how did you approach the material that Laura had captured over how, how many days in the hotel room were you? It, it was um, eight days in the hotel room and many, much, a lot of filming before and a lot of filming after. So this sense of where you put the 
framework and how you work with it as an editor. Can you give us a little insight into your approach? All right. Um, well, first of all, one has to understand that uh, Laura was making a film about surveillance and about the subject before she was contacted by Edward Snowden. So we had already started working, and we had we, we had put together um, quite a bit of a cut already with protagonists that now have disappeared completely from the film because they have been somehow pushed aside by uh, Snowden's um, presence that you know erupted and, and to the stage. Um, and so we had to deal with a lot of footage that was highly interesting and protagonists that were really very compelling um, prior to Snowden. And then when uh, Laura was contacted and finally went to Hong Kong um, and brought this extraordinary new footage and new perspective on the whole story, we had to adapt. And there started um, a process that was uh, improvisational in a way. Uh, from thinking through a subject and uh, advancing analytically, I have the feeling in a way we started to go into uh, reaction mode for a long time, S since not only were we reacting to this new uh, protagonist who ended up being, uh, you know, changing in a way the world as we see it, but also because um, uh, events were still happening as we were editing, and we were figuring out together, th the three of us more or less, uh, what to continue to shoot in order to steer the film in the direction that we did not exactly know had to be the direction because we were still figuring the film out at the same time. So I was quite interested when you were just talking about uh, art reframing events uh, in, in real life mm -hmm. and allowing us to understand them because it's, this was exactly our experience as well. Uh, we were, um, I would say we were, we were digesting what was happening in, in form of historic events around us through uh, the editing work in that we were trying to find a way to tell something that was not yet a story but was becoming one and um, to make that not only work but also express what it really was but also for us to understand what it was while we were doing it. So, yeah, it, that's in a way that was what happened to us in a very compressed way and was very extraordinary. And that's in incredible that the notion of, of time in documentary is often seen as um, sometimes described as slow food. There's time to process it and get meaning from time in a way uh, which you didn't have. You'd had the experience of making your, your previous work and your expertise, but this, as you say, is very compressed. But still... The art, there's a, there's a moment that I've mentioned to you before, which is where Snowden is in the bathroom and he's just trying to get his hair right before going out into the world. And although we knew, as we watched the film, we know what happened because it was such an, a huge story, uh, it took us that moment of, I think, intense humanity where he is looking at himself in the mirror and trying to get his hair right, and he can't, and he's, God damn it. And you suddenly realise, my God, that's a person just before they're about to, as you say, kind of change the world. It's a beautiful cinematic moment. It's interesting. It's the most, one of the most commented upon scenes in, in the film, and I'm interested. It's actually interesting because people read it differently. Um, he's actually trying to leave the hotel without being noticed, and so he's trying to look different... He, than than the image that he's wake that he woke up to, which was suddenly everywhere, and so he's it's not just a moment. He's not actually preparing for cameras, or for a moment of being seen. He's actually trying to see if he can prepare himself for a moment of not being seen, and then but then of course he's sort of I think his head is running through his head is all the possible things that might happen when he leaves the hotel room. And it is the it's the the mirror, isn't it? The power of the mirror in cinema. We're so used to that scene in which people look into the mirror so that we can see into their soul and and. To have that captured in a, in a documentary, I thought was I thought was beautiful. D Dirk, as producer, I mean one of the th one of the things that's um, so striking from that scene as well, apart from the relationship that that you Laura had in the room with the other people, but just this for obvious reasons, this security, this this is it paranoia or isn't it paranoia about security, and presumably as soon as you and Matilda came onto the onto the project, you were you had to have that sensibility too of of feeling constantly under under threat. Am I overstating it? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, 
Laura came to Germany to make this film, and um, Germany, um, if you live in Germany, you do not really feel so stressed about uh, surveillance because we have pretty good protect, uh, projections uh, uh, in laws. And um, there was a lot of uh, stress, but uh, we did not really feel very attacked by anybody. So, And that's why you would want Dirk as your producer on this project. You <laughs> say, like, oh, it's fine, Look. it's okay. But one has to say, though, that uh, one gets very quickly used to using encryption and these kinds of protections that Laura was very um, uh, ex expert in. So that's when, in the beginning of the project, uh, Laura gave us a little, uh, you know, uh, course in, in encrypting emails and chats and these things. And once you know how it works, you just get used to it. That's the new form of uh, working. Do you feel different now? Do you feel safer? Dirk, you can't answer this because you never felt threatened. But, I mean, it st strikes me, it's kind of paradoxical, it's not paradoxical, but it's ironic that from going through the mo possibly the most intensely private and secret period in your lives, you're now so exposed and doing so many interviews and having so many people taking pictures. Do you, d d has anything fundamentally shifted in the way that you see the world through doing this project? Well, how about you? <laughs> They're so cagey. I mean, I would like to answer with a more personal remark. After this evening of uh, all these films that we saw and these excerpts, uh, excerpts of the films, um, I think um, if, if we talk about what we do as documentary filmmakers, it's, if we would talk about it, it's about very depressive things. It's about... Uh, uh, mothers dying. I mean, particularly the short films as well that, that we have seen. It's, it's so powerful, and I'm very touched by all of that. It's about all kinds of catastrophes and disasters, and and you would think that we would be very depressive people making these kind of films, being two or three years with these subjects and about war, about really everything that can be go, can go wrong. And then you go into the cinema, and all of a sudden something very strange happens. You see that what we actually do as documentary filmmakers is create beauty. It's creating hope and meaning. And it's um, something that I think we all can be very proud on. And um, it's all about human dignity. And that's, I mean, what we do. And that's why we take risks. And it's about protecting human dignity. And I think we all can be very proud on doing that. And that would be my answer. There. I think that was an extraordinary use of the Kennedy technique in answering whatever question with what you wanted to say, which was beautiful. I heard you. <laughs> yeah. um, I like that. Yeah, it, it comes in handy. <laughs> thank you. Thank you so much for this. It's, it's been really, really amazing to talk to you. I wish we could talk for longer, but we can't. I understand that there is some kind of award ceremony on Sunday. Um, I just wanted to say, for those of you, you know, there's only one project. Uh, which seems ridiculous as only one project who can who can walk away with a little gold man. But for those of you who don't, just remember that Showa, Thin Blue Line, Hoop Dreams, were ever even nominated. So you're winners already. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.